Our next guest is a very interesting writer and thinker. She has a new piece out in uh, The Guardian uh, in, that was given the headline, Coders of the Word, that's, uh, or that's like programmers, coders. Coders of the world unite, can Silicon Valley workers curb the power of big tech? Uh, Moira Weigel is a PhD candidate at, in Combined Program, Comparative Literature and Film and Media. She is at Yale. She is also the author of a book uh, called Labor of Love, The Invention of Dating, which would make for another interesting conversation, but we're gonna talk about coders right now. So Moira, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me on. Um, and I finished that PhD, I'm up at Harvard now, I'm in a new life phase, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, that's awesome, that's great. Um, <laughs> we'll have to update your bio accordingly. What are you, are you uh, teaching at Harvard or what are you doing up there? Oh, uh, I'm on a postdoc at a place called the Society of Fellows. So yeah, just a three-year fellowship, but just got to make my parents happy and let them know I finally finished that PhD. <laughs> well, good. All right. Well, shout out to your parents here. So uh, now, rather than me try to summarize your piece, although I did read it and, and got a lot out of it, um, what's the fundamental uh, thesis there? What, what were you uh, telling us about? Yeah, so um, the piece is really about uh, a new kind of set of tendencies and energies within the tech industry that I call the tech left. So I think that since last year's presidential election, uh, broadly speaking, there's been a lot more sort of activism and protest kinds of energy, a lot of anti-Trump feeling in Silicon Valley, which is historically, of course, democratic and leans liberal. But the thing that I had seen no one talk about uh, were these specifically leftist energies. So folks who are talking in the language of uh, unionizing or labor organizing or claiming sort of more radical traditions. And a number of those folks who I met, you know, I was sort of reporting this piece for a long time spending time with different groups, but a number of them work at big companies like Facebook and Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, you name it. So what I wanted to speak to was this tendency that I wasn't seeing represented um, in the coverage of Silicon Valley reactions to the election, which was from these young, mostly young, uh, I'd say 20 to early 40 year old uh, technologists and tech workers. So, uh, you know, one of the things, there's so many dimensions to, to that uh, topic, and, and you hit on a lot of them, but one of the things that you allude to, and I, I, I wanted to explore a little further, is that a lot of times when people talk about uh, Silicon Valley being democratic, they're, for example, they're talking about a culture of the sort of, I don't want to say corporate Democrat in this case, Precisely, but there is a kind of deification of wealth and and disrupt the, uh, you know disruption quote unquote move fast and break things is a kind of uh, something that's lionized. You know, uh, President Obama loved uh, that aspect of the Silicon Valley, and, and and it's also often presented in terms of these initiatives. Well, well, we'll just digitize it. We'll disrupt voting because well everybody will be able to do it with an app as if, uh, uh, to which my reaction is always, well, that's kind of, uh, that might be amplifying the problem rather than fixing it. So what was your take on that? The people that you describe on the tech left, are they part of that? Or are they people who really want to undermine that sort of liberal Silicon, uh, you know, I don't know how to call it, uh, power-oriented liberal Silicon Valley culture as well? Do you get my question? I do, yeah. Um, it's a really rich question. I think that it's funny because I think there's been this belief in Silicon Valley, uh, at least since the 1970s or 1980s, that there's something inherently democratic about networked computers, that they're sort of inherently democratizing, and that there's an entire language that you're alluding to uh, around how the internet works, around how social media works, that suggests that these technologies have this are sort of inherently, um, yeah, democratizing. They give power to the individual. I think that what's really interesting, and there are a bunch of aspects to your question. We could take it in different directions, but because there's sort of the difference between big, big D Democratic Party versus this sort of broadly Democratic 
often quite libertarian tradition. Um, but I think that what's interesting is that this consensus or this set of, um, I think, you know, I'd call it an ideology. I think an idea, it's a property of ideology that it looks like common sense for a long time, but this set of sort of common sense beliefs about the internet and the ways it was democratizing are breaking down. And I think we're seeing that very vividly uh, in the Senate hearings with Google and Facebook and Twitter this week. Uh, there was this assumption, I think shared by many, many people for a long time that digital platforms uh, would increase democratic participation, they lower the barriers to entry for you know, media organization points of view, that kind of thing. And I feel like this moment where we're seeing all kinds of problems within the tech industry, these big hearings on how social media platforms and search engines facilitated uh, foreign interference in the election, this kind of thing, that common sense about technology being inherently democratic is kind of breaking down. And I think that the tech left that I'm writing about uh, has an actually sort of new set of ideas about how to deal with that and what that means. Uh, so anyway, that's the beginning of an answer. I'd love to keep to keep talking about it, but I don't want to talk too long. <laughs> no, no, that's I, I, that gets to exactly what I was talking about, including the hearings this week. And you know, I I remember those days when there were there was talk about how the internet was going to make information accessible to everyone and. And, and give everybody a say. Uh, but I think what, one of the many things that was left out of that belief system was the fact that the internet is equally efficient at spreading misinformation as information. In fact, mi misinformation may travel considerably quicker uh, because it may be more attractive and click-worthy. So there's that dimension of it. And then the fact is it doesn't t always bring people together. It may segment them in bubbles or echo chambers uh, where they fall further and further down a kind of rabbit hole of collective delusion. And it's up to you know people to decide who's deluded and who's not. So it, it, it's not really the unifying technology it seems to be uh, or it was held up to be. But then the question comes, okay, you're the tech left or you're, uh, well, we're talking about the tech left now, so let's focus on that. If you're a, a member of the tech left, what are you gonna do about it? I mean, talking about, you talk about tech as labor and how, you know, the labor coalition that's been formed with a cafeteria worker and, mm -hmm. and an engineer, which I think is great. But as to this broader societal question of what tech is doing to us individually and as a society, what do what can the tech left do about that? I think that there are. This is like a huge question. I think yeah, the rest of my lifetime is going to be spent <laughs> people trying to figure it out. But I think that one answer is that for a long time, as part of this broad set of ideas about technology being democratizing, uh, I think that there's been this sense that these platforms are somehow neutral and anyone can use them to express any point of view. Um, and you know. And it, that they're not biased one way or another. And I think that uh, this has been amplified, this tendency for the public to frankly not really understand these platforms that our entire social life and political process has been taken up onto. I think this tendency has been amplified by the fact that when it comes to reporting on Silicon Valley, we usually hear from like six people. Like the discourse is completely dominated by CEOs. It's very rare that you hear interviews with tech workers in the press. Part of this is because they sign so many non-disclosure agreements. You have to sign one just to go onto a tech campus in every case I've ever experienced. But in any case, I think that part of what this has done has is that it's kept how the platforms themselves work from public scrutiny. So for a long time, there was this trust and this assumption that Facebook or Google or Twitter would increase the number of voices that were available, would increase democratic participation. This, uh, this attitude reaches a total crest, I think, right after the Obama election. It's hard to imagine a bigger sort of contrast to the reaction rather than the contrast between the reaction right after Obama and the reaction right after Trump. Anyway, I think in this mix, what the tech workers specifically have is that they have an understanding of how these platforms are built and they work on them every day. And there are all kinds of technical decisions that have real political, uh, social consequences. I think one that I heard some folks talking about just recently was the decision to 
rank content in terms of upvotes or downvotes on a site like Reddit. Mm -hmm. So I heard some engineers speaking about this saying, you know, no woman, no person of color, no marginalized person would have ever designed the site that way uh, because anyone who thinks about certain social issues knows that what that design decision will lead to is marginalized voices getting pushed out and certain dominating voices coming to the top. Um, or, I mean, I think there are a million examples of this kind of thing, but I think the the biggest and most, uh, in a way, like ambitious, utopian, whatever you want to call it, question is the fact that these, you know, every engineer at a place like Facebook ultimately is trying to optimize for engagement, which is profit driven. And the idea has been these companies are very unregulated, uh, that you know, good engineering work optimizes for the amount of time and the amount of data that a user generates on a site, uh, which is valuable because it generates um, data you can sell to advertisers and that generates profit. And I think that what tech workers are in a position to do is to know sort of the details of those engineering decisions and then and how they might play out, you know, what kind of public sphere they might shape. And finally, the last thing I'd say is that Good engineers still have quite a lot of power and bargaining power within these companies. Uh, one of my favorite characters in the piece, who I don't name, uh, is a senior engineer uh, at one of the big tech companies, organized this big protest uh, at Peter Thiel's company, Palantir, in January, went on television, talked about it, and in one of our interviews said said something where he said, you know, I thought I was going to get in trouble for that, and I did kind of get in trouble for it, but then they promoted me because I'm working on this new product. And I think... The reality is that for now, and this might not be true in 10 years, because um, because of the way the labor market is, engineers do have a lot of bargaining power to make certain kinds of demands on their companies. So for instance, I've heard of um, groups of engineers at a particular platform, hell, I'll just say it, it's Airbnb, <laughs> um, going to their boss and saying, we don't want, the, we don't want um, people whose social media accounts show that they're white supremacists supremacists to be able to rent from us in Charlottesville around the time of the Charlottesville protest. So this is these are like very direct examples of ways that these workers who are pretty influential within their companies can go to management and say, uh, you know, here's a thing that we think, here's a way we don't want our platform to be used. And they have a lot of pressure that they can apply to get whatever they're saying. So I think this I, is a I know what, or Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just I know what you're saying, Moira. But here's what I and and it's 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 all good except here's where I I think you know it's going to get interesting soon. Uh, and tell me if you think I'm right or wrong. Uh, what they can't do, no matter how much leverage they have is they can't ask the companies to cease to be what they are. And the fact is that the entire industry is, uh, or large segments of it, as you say, are built around engagement, which is basically addicting people uh, into interacting with them. And when that goes away, they don't have an alternate business model. So they can only push that so far, and the entire industry is predicated on generating data, which is where the yes, no, up, down, swipe left, swipe right, it, it, you know, this kind of a binary set of responses, each one of which creates more data, uh, there, you, you can only challenge that to a certain point, and then the entire Silicon Valley economy is endangered. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens when those two arcs intersect, of, if, if the tech left continues to grow, but the industry still wants to make money the way it makes money. Uh, do you see an intersection like that coming? Do you think uh, I'm on the right track, wrong track? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's interesting, quite a few of these engineers, including ones who work at Google and Facebook, describe themselves as anti-capitalist and really interested in social transformation, which I think um, there's a lot to say about. There are ways in which it's romantic. There are ways in which it's currently, it's clearly part of the sort of Bernie Sanders moment, the huge growth of democratic socialists of America, the sort of groundswell of left energy among young people in this country. I can't even remember whether this made it into the final version of the piece, but a number, I want to say five of the top 10 companies donating to Bernie, how to put this, and the companies with the largest numbers of individual employees donating to the Bernie Sanders campaign were big tech companies. It was Amazon and Microsoft and um, Google and Facebook. And these are, um, so anyway, all that to say, I think that 
the tech left sees what it's doing within its companies as part of an extremely ambitious and long term, you might say romantic set of goals around social transformation. Um, you know, I think there are smart people trying to think about how these platforms could be organized differently. And some of that energy is coming from antitrust folks who are sort of saying like these market driven companies need to be sort of re-embedded in the political or under certain forms of more democratic social control, not social control, but democratic control. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that you have, um, you know, it's funny again, I think that some of them are quite romantic, but there are engineers I interviewed for this story at big tech companies um, who do speak of in sort of like revolutionary terms about what their long term hopes and goals are. I think there's something without caricaturing them about these folks who grew up sort of building things and reading sci fi and like spending time in virtual spaces. It's actually quite amenable to like very ambitious um, kinds of social engineering thinking. I, so I know, I think, ex yeah, I, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about, but I, you know, I think it's going to be interesting because, you know, look, if this turns into something where the, these people are working towards, you know, worker owned, uh, digital companies with a different kind of model that, or, 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 you know, what my friend Jaron Lanier talks about, about people owning their own data or something, it could yeah. be very transformative, but if it becomes what they decide to do is instead of money, you collect red rose emojis that you you could trade for fun and prizes, we've gone nowhere. So it's going to be really interesting. We've only got about 30 seconds left, but if you have any <laughs> closing thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Oh, other than long live the young left. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's pretty good, actually. <laughs> uh, no, thank you for having I mean, there's a ton to say, but thank you for having me on. Um, I would encourage folks, if they're interested, to check out Tech Workers Coalition, um, Tech Solidarity, and the Tech Action Committee, which is part of the Democratic Socialists of America, who have many very active members, and I'm sure would be happy uh, to to share more and bring folks on board. So I think that's all I'd say. Well, closing. that's great. So thanks so much for writing this piece, uh, Moira Weigel, and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.